I'm first and foremost a human being before being a journalist. Um, I'm, I'll describe myself as an everlasting reporter because that's the part of the job that I love the most. So I'm founder of the Foundation for Investigative Journalism. Um, I've done a few, thing, a few things in and around leadership and management in journalism. But the what will remain a permanent fixture will be that I'm a reporter. So a time might come when I don't do reporting as often as I do. Maybe it will be, become once in a year, or once in two years. But that's the, for me, the biggest thing a journalist can be is a reporter. It's what a lot of people ask me. They say, why are you covering? But we know your face, we know your, yeah. When, these days, when I do my stories, I change my looks. So what I change to, I don't want you to see it. Yeah, because it's supposed to be my, my, my look for the field work. So I don't have a problem that people know me, but when I'm on the field doing my undercover work, you might know me from afar, but because of the changes I would have made, you are likely not going to know that that's me. So it's not like I don't, when I'm like, it's not like I don't want people to know that it's me. I don't want people to have a view of that field look. That's why I do it. And, and, and it happened twice that, you know, people thought it was me, they were convinced. And I ended up convincing them that it wasn't me. So you convinced me that it's me, I convince you that it's not me. The word of phrases, I'm a fitness junkie. I like the gym a lot. People go to the gym to lift weights, but in addition, people actually go to the gym to lift weights off their mind. Not just to lift every weight, to lift weight off their mind. So working out is therapeutic for me. You know, I enjoy it. Apart from the physical and health benefits, it's great for me mentally. So I'm a fitness enthusiast. Um, I am an incurable Liverpool fan. I love Liverpool football club to beat. If Liverpool is playing a football match and I'm doing something else, whatever I'm doing, my mind is not 100% in it. I'm in 90, I'm in 80, I'm in 70. Wow, I, when I want to book flights, if the season is on, I check the uh, flight Saturday evening. I check, does Liverpool have a match Saturday or Sunday? Oh, it's Saturday. I, I can't be flying when Liverpool is playing. Oh, please get me Friday flight or a Sunday flight. As a matter of fact, yes, investigative reporting requires you to, to some, in some respects, work alone, but no man is an island at the end of the day. You then have to choose very carefully the people who work with you. There's no investigation that I've done that maybe two people in my personal life did not know from start to finish, even if my colleagues in the office did not know. Still have, I mean, I have a friend. I've just one friend who knows everything about my job. I don't think I have two friends who, for instance, know my movement at every point in time. I have lots of friends that were friends, but there's only one person that I would say, yes, works with me. And it's not someone in the open. It's not someone you would know. You are not connected on Facebook. You are not connected on Twitter. The way that you talk about is not only about the investigative stories. The work that I do is quite complex. You know, I run an organization for it. Apart from the weight of planning investigative stories, I run an organization. I have um, currently an 18-man team that is about to become a 23-man team. And you know, we do our journalism in the public interest, which means we can't take funds from everyone. So you need funds to keep the organization running, but you can't take all funds that are available to you. That's about the biggest headache that I deal with because I'm not going to hire people and sell public interest and social justice to them. At the end of the month, they need to get an alert. If they don't, then they start to think, am I in the right place? I am completely convinced of the importance of the work that I do why it should be done, I have never for a second doubted it. So I've never been in a case where I thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't have told one story. But there are two stories. Again, when we talk about the mental side, the trauma, I wish I could sit here and tell you that, oh, there's a lot of trauma involved in my work. It's A, B, C, D, and E. And then maybe you respect me more because I, you know, because of the trauma that I get to deal with. I wish I could say that, but I would be lying. There are people who, ex who experience trauma on this job, I accept. But for me, if I'm 
rounding off work on story i have another one in my head even if i'm not getting on it in the next one day i'm already planning it in my head i think it's automatic distraction for me um so i wouldn't say there is a lot of trauma of extended trauma however i've had to deal with the trauma for maybe twice short-lived one was the the investigation i did undercover on corruption at mortuaries and cemeteries i went to mortuaries i went to two mortuaries each in ogun lagos and oyo state that was in 2017. i saw over a thousand corpses doing that story so i saw freshly dead someone people two three people died a few hours before i went to that cemetery no that, that mortuary um, I saw people who had been dead for a week, for two weeks, for one month, six months, one year. I saw corpses in their different shades. After that story, for like three, four weeks, every single human being I met, I could picture them in their dead state. Every single human being. You know. In that time, there was no lady that I found attractive. No matter how beautiful you were as a lady, I was seeing you as a dead person. I was seeing what you would be, how you would look if you were dead. But it just landed three, four weeks and, you know, I came back to normal. So it's not like I continued to deal with it, but I didn't really do anything um, spectacular. Then with my prison story, you know, because I didn't expect that I would be um, beaten the way I was, not in prison, but because at some point my cover was blown in prison, they found, they knew who I, they eventually found out who I was. But before they knew who I was, they found a camera on me. They wanted to get me to talk and I wasn't going to talk because I thought if I did, that was the end of the story. So I bought time for myself on that project with my body. So they, you know, undressed me, beat me up, like right into my skin, hit my joints with sticks here, 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 my ankles, all the joints of my body, uh, including my knees. So I think, not that I think, my right knee is not as strong as my left you know me i think that the older i get maybe 50s 60s i need to look after my right knee more than uh, it's it's that part of my body i need to look after because i feel the strain there sometimes particularly when i'm at the gym you know i work to a certain intensity and my right knee cannot take it anymore my left knee can take it and nothing ever nothing else happened to my knees except being hit here you know, in 2019. So I did an undercover investigation last year um, by the prophets of their pockets on, you know, um, religious people who take money from you and give you fake prophecies. And there was an imam, there were two imams, rather, two Islamic you know, people who recited Quran straight into my ears and they were really loud. No, one was really loud. And I think my right ear felt it, my right ear. So I'll say that the body is the carriage of the stories that an undercover journalist has done the body carries it but i wouldn't call it trauma because i pretty much still live a normal life an investigative journalist who adds undercover dimension to their work will not live the same life that people live the, the thing for me is so i grew into into investigative journalism I became a journalist because I wanted to tell stories for public interest, speak for the voiceless, hold power to account. But I didn't start out, which is one of the reasons that I, why I'm known. Because before I did my first major uh, main undercover work, I had written opinions. I was editor, I was founding editor of the cable, I was editor of ICR, I was editor of Sahara Reporters. I spoke in the places. My pictures were online. It was too late when my undercover work started to gain traction. It was too late at that point in time to say I want to hide. My pictures were already on the internet and I couldn't erase them. So in another life, I would start much earlier and then make sure that you don't have my picture anywhere. The terrain, investigative reporting itself is easy in my estimation because X plus X in investigative reporting will always be 2X. If you take certain steps, if you possess certain qualities, you succeed with investigative work. It's not like x plus x times 2x minus y plus dy dx, and you start wondering where is it going to lead to. So in that wise, I consider it easy. But if you are not passionate about it in a terrain like Nigeria, it will be hard for you to have staying power. Because as an investigative journalist in Nigeria, you are constantly swimming against the tide. You're constantly writing about 
powerful people, rich people, influential people who have the means to crowd out your story when it's done, who have the, the means to twist your intentions for doing it, who have the means to confuse the public, mislead the public, who have the means to try to, to stop you from exposing wrongdoing. Um, you have a society that pretends to value investigative work, but in reality does not, you know? So you have a country that essentially wants investigative reporting, but does not value investigative reporting. For instance, people say, oh, there are no investigative reporters in Nigeria. But so even if there are only one, two investigative reporters in this country, in your estimation, how are you supporting them? They have donate links. You know, how many have we given to? You have to support them in what they do. So you are not going to get the kind of support you want. And without passion, staying power is going to be hard. Passion is that one thing that keeps you, that helps you understand the value of the work that you do and why you should continue regardless of the odds. So I would say the most important thing is recognize that an investigative journalist is a seeker of truth. And um, when your work rises to the point where people start to take whatever you say as gospel, where even when you give opinions, people take it as news. And it's happened to me before. I gave an opinion premised on the wrong facts. And people said what I, what I tweeted was fake news. But what I tweeted was not even news. It was an opinion based on a wrong fact. So it comes with its responsibility. It comes with its responsibility. It means that you have to um, think harder before you leap. But it also means that whenever you are wrong, you admit that you are wrong. Because at the end of the day, you are human and you are not infallible. It, the, the target would be limit the mistakes because your mistakes come with heavier weights than those of you know, your colleagues. Limit the mistakes, be more careful before you leap, and um, still ensure that you are pursuing the truth. People have to be able to say that, oh, if it's Fisayo that is wrong, he's going to come back to tell us that he was wrong. And I think so far I've done that. I don't think societal change is possible. In my younger years, I used to be more idealistic. I used to say I was becoming a journalist to pursue societal change. But look, if we started 10 new anti-corruption newspapers in this country today, it's not going to stop corruption. What it can do, make it more difficult for politicians to steal, make it more difficult to steal and escape it, that, you know, help, you know, um, the law enforcement agencies with the right document, right information to prosecute the ones that they want to, yeah, reduce the scale of corruption. So I think that the society can be advanced by journalism. The society can move from one point to another, or the rate of decline in societal values can be delayed, you know, can be slowed down, but it's not like it can be stopped. So I don't believe in societal change. But I, do be, but I do believe in work that's like a drop in the ocean. The ocean doesn't change color, but that drop is important nevertheless. Fact is that we want impact, but impact is not the only reason you tell the story. Sometimes you just want to give a voice to the oppressed, and it is important they have that, they have that voice. Sometimes you just want to bring an issue to public consciousness, because if the consciousness for a problem does not exist, how do you even solve it? If you don't know how bad it is, how easily police trump up charges against innocent people, if I know even, you hear that it, that it happens, but if you don't know how bad it is, how do you even see it as a problem that can be addressed? Sometimes the impact of your story may not even happen in the next 10 years, next 15, 20 years. So impact is something that is sometimes immediate, but sometimes, hard to measure and you have to wait for it. At other times, I feel that I may do five straight investigative stories that bring no impact. The sixth might be impactful in the way that I want. And 
the impact of that sixth story is enough for me to do six stories. The impact of that sixth story is enough to keep me for the next, next 10 stories without impact, knowing that the 11th might just be impactful. And again, I do think that you will be shooting yourself in the leg as an investigative journalist if you ceded control of your mind to external forces, control of your staying power in investigative reporting to external forces. Because sometimes the impact is beyond you. It's about an agency. It's about a public official who needs to act but has refused to act. So as an investigative journalist, you can't give external factors the power to decide whether you do your story or not, whether you do your next story. So everything that happens externally as it concerns my work is not in a position to influence the passion with which I go about the job, the importance I attach to my job. Everything is internal. It comes from internal conviction that this work in the public interest needs to be done. Whether there's impact or there's no impact. Whether there's money or there's no money. Whether it trends or it doesn't trend. Whether it gains public attraction or not. This work has to be done, then it has to be done. Every other thing is secondary. How can everyone agree with you? How can everyone support your work, support you? Even Jesus Christ was not liked by everyone. How can a human being then expect that everyone sees the importance of the work that they do? You know, as journalists, we, 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 we have freedom of expression, we, we write a lot of the things that we want to write. And I think that we should also accord people similar respects. People should have their opinions about the work that I do. And even if those opinions are unfavorable, I should accept that it is their opinion and they have a right to think that way. And I should not be bothered or not let it affect how I do my job. So whatever people think, I have nothing but respect for it, but it doesn't define how I go about my job. So I don't think blogging is a problem. People going on this lover to say, oh, this lover has taken the story and all that. I think that quality and quantity will are usually constantly in a battle. So you have the UK Sun, um, read by many people, but the UK Sun will never be the New York Times. It's just the way it is. There are platforms that people who are not interested in hard news, we read. There's nothing we can do about that. But there are people who also know that news is probably not credible until they've read it from a credible platform. So this lover will always have their crowd, people interested in gossips. This lover, for instance, you know, wrote recently that one celeb you know, had an affair or was having an affair with somebody and described, described, described without essentially naming the celeb and described the girl, described, described, described without really naming her. Of course, that's not allowed in journalism. It's strictly about fact. There are things that I know today that I won't put out because I know them. But if you wake me up and say, where is the evidence I can provide? That I know them, does it change the fact that those things are fact? Yes. Can I prove those things? No. So as a journalist, I'm not going to write them. And that's the difference between journalism and blogging. That bloggers can write whatever they want and can get away with it. The, at the musical artist in question did not even sue the, the blog. If Punch newspaper did it, it probably would be a court case by now. When I want to write, when I'm writing, as I'm currently doing, because I'm working on my next investigation is out soon, and I'm doing a lot of writing, I also a lot of post-production. I'm doing a documentary for the first time. But when I'm writing, I tend, I write, I work more in the night because more people are asleep. No one is messaging me, no one's calling, there's concentration. Um, when I'm not writing, I am more of a morning person. Four or five, I'm up before people. So I'm both. So I've received death threats. Um, recently, someone, after prophets of their pocket, somebody wrote me an email and said I was going to die suddenly, that I was tarnishing the name of people of God. God will, and I replied to him, God will punish you for the effort to send me this email. You know, because somebody once opened a Facebook account, dedicated it to the end of his or show you me. He didn't get my son but you know, in everything he wrote in the, he then sent me a Facebook message and saying, you deal with me, get my family, harm me, and And death threats can't stop me from doing my work. 
any reality of life, any fact of life, can't stop me from being birth is a fact of life. People get married and then they have intercourse, there will be procreation, you know, in most cases, barring infertility, and then there is birth. And then death is another fact of life. Nobody's getting out of this life alive. So what will eventually happen to me that I have made peace with? Why should this stop me from being my... You see, the thing is that a lot of humans have not made peace with death. Yeah, don't talk about death. Don't talk about death. If you don't talk about that for your entire life, you are still going to die. You better make peace with it. And, and that's why people, you know, live their lives, you know, oppress people, abuse power, steal all the money. Because they, they, they never imagine that one day they are going to go and they can't live with all these things. So I made peace with my mortality long ago. And for that reason, it's not something to use against me, to make me stop um, doing my work. Um, in any case, People die without being investigated work. You know, in the last 10 years, how many containers are falling on people on Oju Elegba Bridge? Private people who haven't done investigative work, who are just going about their normal businesses, containers fell, hit them, and that was the end of their life. They're not investigative journalists. So that's how I see it. If I stop investigating work today, there are no guarantees that there will be an additional two years to my life. And I do believe that the work I do is an assignment from God. I'm a Christian, I believe in God, I have his backing to do what I do. Until God says it's my time, I don't believe my life can be cut short. If God says I'm here for the next five decades, I don't think that anyone is able to cut it short. In any case, I don't do this job without also taking certain measures to, to keep myself So That is a fact of life. Why should I stop doing my work? The first death is the death that happens when you have a purpose and you can't fulfill it out of fear. So I would be sitting, I would... You know, I would have died before the death that you are threatening me with if I stopped investigating work because of fear of that. I've had too many death threats to stop this work, but no, that's not going to happen. Number one, I'm not married. I don't have kids yet. I probably will never be married. I probably will be married, but you will never know. You will Maybe I'm even married and you don't know. Maybe I have kids already and you don't know. My private life will hopefully be my best kept secret. That's it. Because other people who didn't, you know, tell you to go do investigative work should not really be, you shouldn't make them soft targets to people who don't like the kind of work you do.